miss everybody on camera. Everybody's here. It's pretty better for you to see. Okay, she got everything. Good. I just and want to you want to check if it works? So this is there's, it? Sound. there's sound. Is that okay? Uh, we should so, make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. It's connected? Yeah, that's connected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Awesome. Um, Thank you so much. Great. So when Mark's back, we're going to get started. And Masood's whole class is watching. Oh, Yeah, I don't know. 
Starts with a lot of It's already streaming. Oh. And we try to get on time because of online people. So we're ready to start. And it is the end of the quarter, and uh, you see the quiet spaces here, which is so nice because we have a nice intimate group here and probably quite a few of you out there are watching even the students from UCLA I know that um, so just to mention briefly to new people Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous started about eight to ten years ago but in San Francisco and over the years it's kind of duplicated and now uh, there's about 60 places around the world. We're one of the first ones that started. When we started, people were saying, what's arts got to do with science? Well, you're never going to get any scientists in the room. Da, da, da. That's not the case at all. And actually, the connection of art and science now is more critical than ever. So this um, laser, these laser gatherings are really meant to quickly exchange information to introduce each other to what we're doing so that we can continue talking to each other collaborate and I have to say quite a few collaborations have emerged out of these talks here that are quite informal and nice so it's social it, it's, it shouldn't be long talks and we're rolling right Mark <laughs> so just to give everybody a sense of how this goes these short talks will be first introduced by me and then every speaker will introduce the next. You'll be prompted by the uh, title. And the first person is Vera Witkowski, who is here from Vienna, from Angewandte, where she's doing her PhD in philosophy, and at the same time doing an MFA at Interface Cultures at the University of Art in Linz. So she's your regular overachiever, and we love her. <laughs> and she does some pretty amazing work. Um, we first met uh, when I was doing a seminar at Interface Culture, and she took my class. And I was like, I have to bring you over. And she came. So Vera, welcome. Thank you so much, Victoria, for invitation. <laughs> and I'm happy to speak here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, yeah, I will talk about the technological replica in the image of the human. That's what I'm doing my uh, thesis about, my doctoral thesis. So um, that is at first. So on which background does this image of the human arise? Second. Uh, what of this humanness is actually um, artificially simulated? So there's a lot of speech and sight and all, all things, but it's just, you know, all the parts. Third, how do these copies of human abilities and expressions act back on the human image? And at last, what does actually all go wrong here? Because it seems as if it does if high-ranking scientists warn about AI doom scenarios. So I'm investigating the theory, the image of the humanness to be a pre-conduction and that it has to be corrected to be able to serve as a model for technolo technology that is constructed for good, that is, in all possible ways, 
ecological, ethical, social, non-predominant, equal, diverse, you name it. I think only from this point we could restart to think what technology we actually need and what we would like to create. So why do I put the human in the center of research? <laughs> because this technology that is said to may end this topic, in my view, is shaped after an androcentric, disembodied self-perception of supremacy that is deeply rooted in the Anglo-European societies and embedded in its so-called cultures. I very much do embrace the theories that could be summarized by new materi materialism and posthumanism because they talk about this planet's most complex entanglements and interactions of all sorts of living be beings and matter and its fragility. But I do not consider it powerful enough to initialize change of this androcentric culture by just theorizing it without really hurting its underlying very substance. It is not enough to degrade the human in all his self-invented supremacy by pointing to him that he is, he is not more but in line with other living beings and fellow animals. That he has no right that <coughs> at all to think that he can exploit everything and every living being he assumes as a resource, resource and uh, dominate others. That he must not build his technology on the cost of others. And if I say, him, I mean him, this particular human is not including other genders. Precisely, he is not including anybody and others at all. I deeply wish to hold him accountant. Just trying to tell him this is a bit like, oh, we have understood that our algorithms are biased, so let's just uh, um, feed them with diverse data so to get this right. Um, because biases are so deeply rooted in our, our so-called cultures that we will have to find sufficient methods to root out first. Or, maybe better, to let the roots decay. Which means to also let the hymns decay who feel to be, be in charge to take decisions align, aligned with this biased culture and to create his machines in his very own image. Besides, those, little, lit, those nice little theoretical notions would not be powerful enough to change the underlying culture, there's another issue. In my opinion, this particular humanness also roots in an unequal achievement of skills during evolution. The skills of social competence and responsibility seem not to have kept up with other human skills. To ground this theory, I use a very interdisciplinary approach. My suggested concept is to in a multidisciplinary mode to pin down the human self-perception, to vivisect him, to dig in every corner. I want to prove that this human is not at all what he likes to believe about himself. And that, if we do not want to head into a dystopic machine future, we have to challenge or to particular um, build a new image of ourselves. Or get the image right, better maybe. I therefore consult the uh, history of religion, of philosophy, and uh, of that what we have learned to call, call culture. I search in sociology and political science. I screen papers by biologists, epidemiologists, psychologists, neuro neurobiologists, geneticists, endocrinolo endocrinologists, computer scientists, and engineers. And I especially look very closely at simulations the human has created in his image that he pretended to be neutral. These uh, replica do not only reflect and mirror human self-perception, but they also reassure and affirm his se sense of self. And in some cases, they even become role models, desired ideals that the human wants to emulate. According to these logics, it is coherent that research also foul, follows in the lines of human enhancement for efficiency and to secure the human to stay at last as smart, smart as his new gods he is creating in his diffracted image. Thus, the human is not only shaped by the environment, the social, the cultural, the material, and all the connectivity he tends to deny, to ignore, or to get rid of. He is also shaped by his self-created technology. 
in his disconnectedness from his environment, from others and from himself, he very easily gets anxious about everything that is not him or the things that, uh, he, that he and others he feels to own. Therefore, he produces technology for surveillance and control, for defense and destruction, and for automation, as he trusts his machines more than people, and besides, he does not care for other people's lot. He further produces technology for the maximization of assets or, or status, because these are the only rewards that seem real to him. The other technology he is creating is for entertainment and so-called called services, and people willingly provide him with their data by hours of unpaid occupation. This data, in turn, contributes to improve the before-mentioned technology. Besides, this exhausting entertainment, again, disconnects us from the material world and overwhelms our minds. It prevents discrete and critical thinking and makes people powerless. We then, even more, try to escape into the digital world and get away from it all in this again, are easier to control. Technological possibilities, because we can, technology is sexy, we can do <coughs> everything with it. Science qualities, so who's first? We have to be in a rush and we have to be the first to detect something, to build something. And corporate and military interests, so who pays for what? Maybe the most important thing, are about to overrule ethics. So there is a lot of distraction, unhealthy dependencies, and alienation going on. But I do not want to end with this one-sided, quite polemic outline. Oh, I forgot to put a slide. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but um, there is also very bene beneficial technology out there. So this technology not only serves um, people, like for example medicine, but also helps us to better understand our environment and fellow beings and helps us with more connectivity to the actually not new, but very original material world. Some people have broadened the range of connectivity with the world and thus the view of what a human is. They are all artists and perceive themselves as cyborgs. For example, Neil Harbison, fully um, born, fully color blind, blind, he can now hear colors. Then there's Moon Rebus, um, she can feel seismic uh, changes worldwide with her elbow. And um, Manel Munoz, um, who is very obsessed with the weather, he has a device that he can detect um, the um, atmospheric pressure. Their sensors are permanently connected to their bodies and it's all open source, so you can augment yourself as well if you want. There are also others with new senses out there, for example sensing magnetic fields, geographical north and the best spot for wireless communication. <laughs> as you could have guessed, Alphabet, the corporate behind Google and Co is investing <coughs> huge amounts of money in correspondent research. So this was my uh, part for my um, dissertation and uh, some quick words um, for my related artwork um, that I should actually do a concept here, that's why I'm also here, um, for, the, for my interface cultures master. So maybe you've heard about the uh, hormone oxytocin. So there are studies that showed, sh show that increase of empathy after a treatment with a dose of uh, oxytoci oxytocin nose spray. Maybe you have also heard about uh, neural stimulation. A few years ago I read a paper about brain-computer interface developed for military purposes that suppress the so-called so artifacts in the brain of soldiers to make the pers person solely focused on, for example, operating a drone. It was the word artifacts for human doubts and scruple in this particular context that irritated me most. But there are also very positive projects using neurostimulation, for example, offering help against depression. So what I would like to develop is an actual or speculative tool that helps to catch up with evolution in regard of human social skills, a sense that connects. 
a device that makes people learn to feel and love themselves and experience the meaningfulness of their bodies. It should work like a new sense of neural stimulation, brain-computer interfaces, combined with some oxytocin-like effect. At its best to be available low-cost and off-shelf in every supermarket, and it should work like a legal drug that makes everybody happy, empathic, and caring for themselves and other beings and environment they live in. I think if we could make this planet a good world, then we should have such a device. <laughs> and um, now, if you would like to help me with this project or have them some advice or suggestions or want to join, then please contact me. Here's my email address. Okay. Yeah, and uh, now I may introduce uh, G.I. and she's the next speaker. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, Vera. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jai Young. Um, thank you so much for coming here today, and thank you, Victoria, for the warm invitation. Um, I'm a practicing artist. I'm also an assistant professor at the design department at UC Davis. Um, today, the project I'd like to talk about is titled, What does the bot say to the human? I'm um, just going to give a brief introduction to the project, and then I'll show two process videos, which will um, give you a comprehensive uh, understanding of the process that we went through to develop that project. Um, and then during conversations later today, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have, so I look forward to that. Um, so the project uh, uh, basically transforms 2016 um, U.S. presidential election Twitter data uh, into a large-scale installation. Um, essentially to probe this question of artificial intelligence. Um, in this particular case, via the way of social media, uh, assumes form and transforms the shaping of the future of a nation. Um, the method that I used was Twitter streaming API, which is uh, um, and it's, it's free for everybody to access. Um, at about 10 gigabyte a day, we archived the Twitter data that had to do with the uh, US uh, uh, presidential election. Um, information collected including hashtags and keywords and user profiles and timestamps when particular Twitter activity occurred and the tweet contents and locations, etc. Uh, we identified major Twitter influencers in the, uh, in the period um, between February to November <coughs> 2016. We differentiated human tweets from uh, robotic tweets. We uncovered propagation patterns in the um, entire Twitter landscape uh, worldwide. So again, it uh, installation recounts election activity from February to November 8th, which is uh, the election date of 2016. Um, the uh, um, installation exposes the uh, essentially the inner mechanism <coughs> of uh, of this world that's invisible to us, where true human uh, regular Twitter activities um, and artificial intelligence automation activities mutually um, influence each other, bond together, and propagated uh, inseparably um, as a combined force. So the question to me um, in developing this project was uh, the fact that you know the Amer American public did not know about about this uh, pre 2016 election. Um, person like me was left post election um, wanting to understand the phenomena uh, at some level. Um, it is no way to say that this installation answers the question as to what happened in 2016 election. However, it's just a way for the public to come together as a place to contemplate essentially our social fabric today, um, our relationship to technology and uh, how technology was developed and being used for what purpose. Um, with that, I'll show you the video. What does the boss say to the human came about in <coughs> December 2015 during a dinner with Louis Dongyan, the CEO of Kinemans, a data science startup in San Francisco. We wondered what our project would put it together with the election Twitter data he has been collecting. In the preceding months, we looked at top hashtags in the worldwide Twitter landscape on the election 
and discovered that by July 2016, which is the second day of the Republican National Convention, 1.8 million election-related hashtag tweets were generated. Eight out of nine top hashtags belong to Donald Trump um, or the uh, Republican Party. Hillary's hashtag, I'm with her, was number seven, and it's the only non-Republican hashtag that made the top ten. We didn't know at the time what this all meant and decided to create a temporary participatory installation to engage the public for a conversation. So we did that on July 24th, 2016 at the Jurassic um, Scientific Valerian Madness 3.0 at the Jurassic Artist Residency in Mountain View, California. On a very warm summer afternoon, we used the IV bags filled with water that dripped at the rate of which the hashtags were being generated. We labeled each bag with the hashtag it represented. Like rain, the water dripped onto the visitors. Some danced under it, others tasted it and spit it out. For people who did not want to be rained on with <coughs> rain, we provided them with little umbrellas. By September 2016, Twitter election activities continued to increase. Both Weidel and I were born and raised in communist China, where freedom of speech continues to challenge human rights in the country. To this day, there is no Facebook or Twitter in China. So we decided to make a space that tells a story of this shifting moment in history where social media produces a new social relationship. Then October, November 2016 came around. The presidential race intensified, and the rhetoric on social media was invasive to the public. By then, the representation shifted. Water in the IV bags changed into sickly fluorescent green glowing under black eyes. On the evening of the election day, November 8, 2016, poetry reading carried on in the historic basement gallery at UC Davis as the nation tallies its votes and the green fluid drift in the space. In the wake of the 2016 U.S. presidential election, many of us have a lot of questions. Given this new social landscape, as an artist and a designer, I wondered what is the responsibility of an artist today? I'm interested in creating social interventions that take the form of a publicly engaged data-driven large-scale installations to communicate the significant role artificially intelligent algorithms now play in mainstream American life, democracy, and politics. I decided to lead a team of data scientists and engineers to expand the scale of the project to incorporate 300 units of LED lights and 60 micro speakers in a space where data patterns and influencer relationships are mapped with a high level of precision according to data analytics and unfold in a timely sequence. When walking into the installation, visitors are in most in flickering lights and clicking sounds saw the exchange of fluid between the IV bags and experienced an accurate account of election-related Twitter activity in the nine months leading to the election date of November 8, 2016. The installation told the story of how top election Twitter bots, through sophisticated computer algorithms, influenced the human accounts through uh, continuous retweeting, replying, and following, thereby participating in the spreading of targeted election messages. The artwork provided a physical space for contemplating the significant challenges social media now pose in understanding of our social fabric and the ways in which we now relate to each other. Over a 15 month period since the completion of the fabrication of the installation, the project was exhibited at 12 cultural and public places, engaging thousands of visitors. As a society, we're now faced with powerful technologies that are used to disrupt democracy. Social media giants are rarely 
reflexes to purge data in the viewer's history, and a deepening dependence on data in the ever-expanding data mining culture operating without much restriction and little recognition for data biases. I remain committed to continuing to examine the rapidly evolving social media landscape and to create installations and social interventions for dialogue that pushes toward a more generous and inclusive society. So this is uh, um, before and post 2016 election. I'm now on to uh, preparations for the 2020 election. Um, would, would love to talk to you all more about that uh, later on. I wanted to recognize my team here. Um, uh, data Archive was performed by Wei Dong Yan and uh, Technology Direction by Shi Wen Yang. Uh, data Analytics was performed by a PhD student at Chi Lian Yu, who was a part of uh, Dr. Robert Tui's uh, 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 data group in the um, engineering department at UC Davis. Uh, also, Bartek Kusek was our engineer for the, for the project. Thank you so much. Amy Taylor. Next is my uh, pleasure to introduce Amy Taylor. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining and thank you Victoria for the invitation. Uh, so I started my career really more focused on the fine art gallery world and I had made these linear portraits in art school and I was really interested in seeing how these images and images translate across multiple media and so these pieces I did, I dyed canvas with synthetic dyes, then I screen printed the image onto the canvas to use as a stencil and embroidered onto there and uh, with the woman in blue I also did a little weaving on the forehead. And while this was going on I was also working at a screen printing studio that specialized a lot in like gig posters and art posters and so I screen printed the images onto 18 by 24 posters. So the top is white ink on craft paper, and the bottom is gold metallic ink, which really shines and looks super cool in real life. Um, and I was really considering like being a professional screen printer, and I was really interested in how to capture a fragment of a story in an image and how to make it compelling and sort of mysterious and get you engaged and create a backstory in your mind for what you were seeing and so that's really what I was doing with these top images here and those caught the attention of a musician in San Francisco who hired me to do some album art and EP art for some singles he was releasing and that's what's going on on the bottom here and the only image he really requested was a combination of a penguin and a mouse. <laughs> and so I did the mock-up for it, and he hated it so much. He didn't incorporate it at all. I thought it was really cool and really weird, and I wanted to play with it more. So Penguin Mouse was born. <laughs> and I had so much fun working on it and playing with it, and I wanted to keep going with it a little bit more. So next came Pigeon Gazelle. <laughs> and while all of this was going on, uh, with synthetic dyes, the recipe is always the same. And once you master it, that's it. You hit the ceiling. And so natural dyes were just the next step in it. Little did I know, it'd be a major <laughs> rabbit hole introducing me to chemistry and history and sustainability. And so I was studying under uh, a chemicon who teaches and works primarily out of Chicago. And she teaches really traditional Japanese methods and materials. And it's very structured. And her work is beyond exquisite. And I was really just playing around with different resist techniques. And um, in this time, I applied for a natural dye residency in Oaxaca, Mexico, which to this day is still one of the natural dye capitals of the world. And I worked under Elsa Sanchez Diaz, also known as Tenido Amano, and 
dyed a ton of silk, a ton of yarn, really worked in this much more unstructured, like, yeah, throw this in, see what happens kind of way. And so for my big project, I wanted to play more with the animal hybrids of my past and also apply that with the alebrijes of Oaxaca, which are these brightly painted animal sculptures. And they're sort of these Frankenstein animal that the first one came from a fever dream in the turn of the century of a donkey with butterfly wings. And so this was my mock-up sketch and I wound up embroidering it with hand spun silk that I had dyed. Um, and it wound up taking me about six months to get it done. I was still working on it for a long time after my residency ended. Uh, and <laughs> then a few months after that, my company, Ms. Amy Taylor, was born, where I make naturally dyed underwear designed to actually cover your bottom all day. And that started because after my residency, I was really interested in natural dyes and especially the chemistry of them. And I wasn't a sewer though. And so I wanted to find wholesale blanks that I could dye and, and bring to consumers. But there really wasn't anything that was good quality and reasonably priced. And I took a sew your own underwear class that I'm now teaching. And I was like, oh, my other passion is butts. <laughs> and it was the first time that I realized that all underwear I had ever worn before was super uncomfortable. And I started talking to other people in the community. And they were like, yeah, women's underwear is really uncomfortable. <laughs> and it leaves you in a constant wedgie. Or they're these really like up to your chest granny panties. And why isn't there anything? that's comfortable and beautiful. So I was like, cool, I'm gonna do that. And so this was from my first batch of underwear when I launched my company. I made over 300 pairs uh, with four colors and totally love doing it. And it's definitely been a challenge. And then about a year or so later, last year, uh, the same residency organization that I worked with in Oaxaca reached out to me because they opened a new program in Peru about an hour and a half outside of Cusco in a province called Urubamba. And they very generously offered me a scholarship to go do another natural dye residency down there. So of course I took it. And I learned all new plants, <coughs> all new methods, all new materials. And I really saw firsthand how this knowledge is shrinking that in Peru, which was once one of the natural dye capitals of the world, I mean, really, really extraordinary. We couldn't even get all of our supplies down there. We had to bring a bunch from Mexico because it was no longer available. And the only people who are really teaching it and still have the knowledge are indigenous women. And so I worked with my instructor, Maria, and like she took me out foraging for materials. And we just used plants that I'd never heard of. And she showed me how to combine things in totally different ways, including using urine as a modifier, which is really traditional. The ammonia affects the pH, but it's not something people do anymore. And so I really started thinking about how I can incorporate all of this into my practice and what can we do to make apparel more sustainable? Because the textile industry in fast fashion is the second biggest polluter in the world. And so what sort of the big question that I'm really playing with is how can we incorporate these historical methods and materials that are safe to wear on your skin, safe to flush down the sink in this sort of bigger contemporary way. And so I really want to make my work more sustainable. So one of the ways that I'm trying to do that is I eliminated elastic from my design because that was really the last synthetic piece that was in there. So I'm using the fabric itself instead. And also switched over to a new material called tensile which is super cool. It's made from eucalyptus bark and it's so, so soft. And where people were once hailing bamboo as the super fabric, 
tensile sort of taken over because the water and the chemicals necessary to break down the eucalyptus from bark to fiber is a closed loop system. So all the water and all the chemicals can be reused over and over and over until they're almost completely depleted. And so now the really big things I'm working on are experimentation and learning more and trying to bring all these practices into a better apparel industry. And thank you so much. Oh, yes, please. And the next person to speak is Sam Locasio. Great. Thank you. Uh, so my name's Sam, and I'm going to be talking to you about um, decoding genetic programs of brain wiring. Uh, I'm a scientist here at UCLA. Um, so, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the, the circumstances that bring me here are, are very fitting because uh, I'm a scientist, and I have an interest in using science to create art. Um, and this is a microscopic picture of the worm that I studied for my PhD. Um, and it shows its nervous system and brain. And my sister is an artist who uses art to communicate uh, concepts in science. And this is a sculpture that she made that depicts uh, the structure of the universe at the galactic scale. And uh, my sister recently visited me here in LA. And she introduced me to Victoria, who invited me to give this talk. So uh, that's why I'm here. And um, I'm also glad to be here because I think that the role of the scientist uh, in society is twofold. Uh, one role is to expand the bounds of human knowledge, and we do that by performing experiments to learn about the natural systems around us. And the second role that's also very important is to communicate the knowledge that we learn uh, to humanity so that it can be put to practical use and also um, appreciated for its aesthetic beauty. And I think that the second role um, really would be hopeless without art, so that's a reason why I'm really excited uh, to be here. And um, so the, my general field of study is developmental neuroscience. And the general question of that field is, how do you build a brain? Or rather, how is a brain built? And this is an enormously complex question, because we start off as a single cell, which has to divide and grow and differentiate to form an entire body. And that body includes a brain, which is a biological computer that's made up of billions of cells with trillions of connections among them. And it's capable of conscious thought, among other things. And you know, when approaching such a complex question, one thing you have to do is kind of break down that question into its component parts. And a brain, like the other organs uh, in your body, is made up of cells. And the cells in the brain are, are called neurons. And in the early 1900s, a scientist called Ramon Cajal uh, spent his life um, observing brains at the microscopic scale and describing what he saw. And in this process, he made these beautiful illustrations of different types of neurons. And what you can immediately appreciate, besides all of the other things that he taught us about the brain, is just from these few illustrations how uh, complex and diverse uh, different neurons are in their shapes and sizes. And these different morphologies of these neurons really underlie the way that a brain fits together and uh, how they carry out their particular functions. So for example, this is a Purkinje neuron. It's located in your cerebellum, which is important for co physical coordination and balance. Um, this is a pyramidal neuron. You can find them in your neocortex, which you use for visual or, uh, sensory processing and higher thought. And then these are neurons in the hippocampus, uh, which is a structure that's um, <coughs> required for learning and memory. And you know, a major goal of, of neuroscience is to understand how our genes uh, shape the way that our brain is built uh, by sculpting uh, the morphologies of, of, of particular neurons. And so for the, those of you who are not super familiar with this concept, so um, basically all of our genetic information is stored in DNA on long linear molecules uh, called chromosomes. And our genes are laid out along these chromosomes like keys on a piano. And just like keys on a piano, these genes can be played or left silent, or those genes can be turned on or off. And generally when we say that a gene is on, we mean that a cell is accessing the information in that gene to create a corresponding protein that carries out some function for the neuron. So for example, this Purkinje cell might turn on gene A, which creates a corresponding protein that allows it to have these beautiful dendritic structures. Another neuron with, a, with the same keyboard plays a different note, a different, which creates a different protein, which might allow it, say, to build this axon that it uses to communicate with other neurons. 
And so we want to understand the relationship between genes and specific attributes of neurons to understand how brains are built. But of course, this itself is very complex uh, because every neuron actually has access to a huge keyboard of thousands of genes, and every neuron plays a different combination of genes in a particular song during development to get to the way that it is. And so we need some way to reduce the complexity of this problem uh, and, and to be able to make such uh, kind of comparisons between genes and actual functions. And so in our lab, we turn to the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. This is the fly that you get in your kitchen uh, when you leave the bananas out for too long. Hmm. And um, they're advantageous for studying neural development in many ways. Um, one is that their brain is a lot simpler than ours. It's about a million times smaller than ours. It's a half millimeter uh, across and contains about 100,000 neurons. Um, and the other advantage of studying uh, this organism is that it has tremendous genetic tools that allow us to um, observe uh, reproducibly specific neurons within the brain and uh, manipulate them genetically to understand the relationship between genes and the structure of a nervous system. <coughs> and that's an example on the right. And this particular, uh, there's a particular neuron that um, we're studying in the lab right now, and they're called T4, T5 neurons, and they're required for uh, detecting visual motion. So when, when an object passes in front of my visual field, particular neurons tell my brain that there's an object moving in front of my eyes and it's moving in that direction. And that's what they do for the fly. Um, and all of the T4, T5 neurons have a particular shape or morphology. They have a cell body where their DNA is, and then they have dendrites, which are structures for receiving information for, from other neurons, and then this projection kind of turns around and makes an axon terminal, which is what a neuron uses to communicate with other neurons. And there's actually eight different types of these T4, T5 neurons, and they vary in a very, very small ways in terms of how they're wired up to the rest of the brain. And uh, one way that they vary is that their dendrites can be wired up either to something called the medulla or something called the lobula, which we'll just call M and L. And then in addition, their axon terminals can connect to four different layers in a structure called a lobular plate. And so they basically can make two choices for wiring for where their blue things are and four choices for wiring for where their red things are. And because these neurons are so similar with these very defined differences, we reason that the songs that they play, these genetic songs that they're playing during development might be very similar to one another with variations on a common theme. And these variations on the common theme might actually underlie these differences in their wiring. And this is what they look like uh, when you express fluorescent molecules inside of them. This is all of the T4, T5 neurons labeled in pink, so you can see the overall structure, and then a single neuron labeled in green. So to kind of understand uh, the genes that they're expressing during development to see whether this, this is true, uh, we used a technology called single cell sequencing. And what that means is basically you can ask for any individual neuron during development, what are all of the genes that it's expressing? And then we can represent all of these individual <laughs> neurons on a plot like this, where each dot represents one neuron, and the distance to another dot tells you how similar that neuron is to the other dot. Okay? And like I told you, there's eight different types of T4, T5 neurons, and they cluster into eight different clusters of dots, which we think correspond to those eight subtypes of the neurons, right? And now once we have these different subtypes, these different genetic programs for the different subtypes, we can ask what are the specific genes that most strongly contribute to the differences in these different neurons during development? In other words, which genes are very on in some of them and off in the others, okay? And then once we identify, we identified several of those genes, and then we can ask which specific neurons those genes are expressed in by tagging those genes with fluorescent molecules that cause the neurons that express them to light up green. Okay? And so we can map these specific genes to specific subsets of these T4, T5 neurons. And what comes out of this is actually quite remarkable. The genes that contribute to them being different are actually expressed in subsets of T4, T5 neurons with shared wiring features. So for example, this gene KLG or Klingon um, is expressed in all of the neurons that project to layers C and D, and not the other ones. And then this gene, BEAT4, is expressed in all of the neurons that project to B and C, but not the other ones. And finally, this gene, DPR2, is expressed in all of the neurons that project to M, but not the neurons that project to L. And all, almost all of the genes that we found that contributed to differences among these neurons fell into these three classes. 
So we were really excited about this because we thought, well, maybe this beautiful correlation between <coughs> gene expression and wiring might actually be shaping these neurons. So to test that, what you have to do, and what you can do in Drosophila very nicely, is silence those genes specifically during development to see whether they're required for the development of those particular structures. And so this is what the T4-T5s look like in normal flies. So there's four layers, A, B, C, and D. C and D are pink, A and B are green. And then we can take a gene like this gene OMB, or optomotor blind, which is expressed specifically in layers C and D. And when we silence that gene during development, we no longer have layers C and D. All of the T4, T5 neurons project to just layers A and B. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the gene GRN, which just projects to the layers B and C, when you turn that gene off during development, all the neurons no longer can project to B and C, they only project to A and D. And so using this, this approach in, in flies, basically we can take, find specific genes that we identify that are expressed in specific neurons and that guide the development of those specific neurons and sculpt their, their shapes so that they can have all their particular features, um, which gives rise to an overall organization of their nervous system. And you know the organization of nervous systems into layers is not peculiar to the fly. It's seen throughout the animal kingdom, including all over our own brains. And so we think such an approach uh, <coughs> might give us insight into fundam fundamental mechanisms uh, by which brains are organized across the animal kingdom. So with that, I'll just acknowledge uh, my collaborators, uh, my mentor, Larry Zapersky, and then Ju Yun Yu and Yerbal Kermangaliev, who I uh, um, performed this current project with, and then the NIH for my funding. Thank you. Hi, my name is Masood Kamandi. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I'm very grateful to be able to present here tonight. Um, I wanted to stay away from media for this presentation, whether new or old. So I wanted to talk more about terms. So for me, um, the most important terms are, in my work, um, perception, the ability to see, hear, become aware, and augmentation. And perception, I think of optical perception. My background is in photography. And augmentation, for me, I, I think about um, in terms of technology. I also kind of wanted to introduce three very int uh, important terms for me and how I, how I identify them. Um, one being art. Um, I'm an MFA from UCLA. Um, so for me, art is about communication, history, and context. Design uh, has become, after my MFA, about participation with other humans and empathy. Um, and science, for me, has become a framework, is a framework, to understand perception. Now, my background is photography, and for me, photography has always been about um, the overlooked and making things in our world more, um, more special, things that may seem ordinary that we might overlook. Um, and it's also about being able to, to tell and own our own stories um, and the second point about owning your own story it was very important to me after September 11th because uh, my family is from Afghanistan. Um, I'm gay. My family has not been very good about that, has had a really hard time about that. So for me, it was always, it's always been very important to have a connection with my culture that I haven't been able to have with my family. Um, and so I traveled to Afghanistan I have been traveling there. Um, uh, the first time was in 2002, and this is a photograph I took of their Department of Fine Art. Um, and this, I think, has to do with the idea of augmentation. Um, with my undergrad uh, or the undergrad school, School of Visual Arts, um, we created a project to create a photography department there. They ended up uh, organizing an auction and raised about $100,000 and sent me to teach the first courses and develop the department there. This is the construction and then this is what it was like after it was finished. And um, photography was of course banned by the Taliban. It was, they did not um, allow graven images to be taken. So for me there was a huge amount of symbolic value in, in going back to my family's country and teaching photography to 70 students, teaching the first classes and training um, 
training the professors to take over the program. And that's, that's me in 2005 with my first students. And they're learning to uh, load a black and white film, wow. which is very challenging, wow. whether you're in Afghanistan or the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and this is one of their photographs. And I think the whole idea of the overlooked um, was very important for me in, in Afghanistan. Um, there's, they have so much of a strong sense of the poetics of the everyday, and I saw that through all the photographs that my students took is, is evidenced here. So moving forward for me, I've, I've seen experimentation as the, the common theme throughout all of my interests. Um, and when I was at UCLA, I worked with um, Casey Reese and learned how to develop software. And I was also very influenced by uh, the history of these makers and photographers who um, were also scientists. This is uh, an image by Etienne Jules Marais, who is a French photographer and scientist who um, shot photographs of the gun and inspired the futurists. And this is an image of a crane or a pelican that he took. And then this is me on my staircase, um, experimenting with image stacking and uh, writing software to compress uh, a bunch of images into a single image. So exploring time and space. And this idea is called chronophotography. Um, and there's a, a history of it. But what I realized in writing the software was that not only could I compress um, time, as they did, and, you know, it's called chronophotographer photography, but I could also compress space and explore my surroundings and ordinary objects. And so going back to the idea of the overlooked, um, these are all objects. This is a, an installation at Documenta. And these are all very, very plain objects. Those are Christmas lights, those are eggs, paper, saran wrap, a light bulb, but they've been transformed by process. And for me, that's kind of about paying attention to your surroundings and not being an, a robot or an automaton. This is a, a botanical uh, piece. It's a, actually a bougainvillea, which is a plant we see everywhere in California, but it's been transformed by this process. It's actually about 57 photographs of the bougainvillea, and the algorithms compress them and transform them. The result you get is you don't really know what you're going to get mm -hmm. as you do it. So it's a very experimental process. And I was fortunate enough to be able to go back and share this with students in the same department that I created um, several years prior. And their works were shown at Documenta as well. So there's a lot of shorthand um, in social science and literature that kind of describes what I do. You know, I said, um, this kind of the idea of the overlooked. Uh, Matter Out of Place is an idea by Mary Douglas, who's an anthropologist. My husband's an anthropologist. Um, that says that you know, things that are out of place can become sacred by their being out of place. And Ostrenenia is a, an idea from Russian formalism about kind of not becoming an automatic person, really engaging with the everyday, not being blind to the things that surround you. Um, and I like those ideas, and I'm not going to go through the whole list, but it's kind of nice to know that there are these ideas that exist. It makes me feel like I have you know, a, a fellowship out there. Um, but I don't kind of create these images. This is a kind of an instinctive thing. I don't create them with these ideas in mind. So this is a good example. This is from a series called Matter Out of Place. And these are bottles I bought at uh, CBS and <laughs> various colors, remove the labels. I was really interested in the, the spectrum. and. Um, using software to separate all the colors and, and smear them in the direction that they appear in the, in the color wheel. And um, that might be hard to see in this particular image. This is the final product, but as a study, I created a video and uh, kind of separated them this way so you can kind of see a little bit better exactly what's happening. And then finally, um, Moving deeper into software development, I wanted to continue with this idea of um, augmenting perception, um, augmenting visual perception in real time. And so I developed an app. It's called Oblique. Uh, this is an iOS app. This is a picture of the interface with um, a shutter release at the bottom. You can choose filters with the, the green uh, triangle, and you can change the image uh, brightness and contrast and saturation and stuff on the right side with the magenta buttons. And 
this is a video of working through the interface. So everything is real time. So the idea was, how do I get out into my out of my studio and out into the world, and be more present in my life, and not have an interface which these interfaces are known for sucking us in and consuming our lives, but have an interface that actually makes me engage with the world in real time. You can't do post processing with this app. It's, it all has to be real time. So you have to sit there and actually manipulate your view. And um, I made a series of images called The Effect of Lightning on a Rainbow. Um, and these were exhibited here in Los Angeles. And these are some examples of the images I created. These are um, they're parking lot flowers. There's like amazing rose garden in our parking lot. So I can go, <laughs> strangely, in downtown Los Angeles. LA. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that something so kind of mundane can be transformed, in, you know, something so overlooked can be transformed into something beautiful. Um, and, and also, you know, computer screen, uh, plants from the flower market, the interior of a box, philodendron, and another parking lot rose. So all things that are very, very ordinary and yet attain this kind of special status through process. So I guess in making this presentation, I've been thinking um, all of those ideas, that list of ideas, I would love to expand from that more literary, uh, the social scientific idea, framework for perception, into a more cognitive framework for, for perception, which um, I think I teach interaction design, so that's kind of influencing <coughs> a lot in terms of cognitive science. And my question is, as I move forward, how can I use software to heighten awareness, uh, reduce automatism, and increase criticality? So that's, that's me. Thank you. Wow. I have to say this was just such a pleasure to me to see how all of this came together. And I was taking notes feverishly trying to see what the connections were. Actually, the way we put slides together is as they come to us. And Vera sent hers last. So she was going to go last. And she said, maybe not. I looked and I thought, no, you go first. And in a way, she totally framed what was happening afterwards. And I just jotted down the questions that Masood just asked, is heighten awareness, reduce automatism, increase criticality. That's exactly what she started with, actually, in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had GI show us some of the amazing work that she's doing with bringing in that kind of critical uh, large-scale awareness about politics in particular. I'm very curious where it goes with 2020. It's really scary times, actually. Um, to lighten things up, we had some underwear <laughs> <laughs> But I have to say that um, your work with uh, Indigo and various uh, materials is so fantastic. I'm wearing a scarf that you gave me a while back. Um, I think that uh, eco-materialism that Linda Weintraub talks about is just so critical right now th when we think about uh, social networks and social unrest and any kind of political situations. It's very much caused by climate change that we caused. So to create solutions is not the way to look at it because you use the same tools that created the problems. Uh, so we're here to envision different types of futures. And when we have Sam talking, we can see how even a fruit fly is so connected to us. You look at a fruit fly and you think about our own consciousness. It's so crazy. So of course, we have to think about the ethics of you know, making those little genes quiet and waking them up. What does that mean? What can we do to us doing that? And. Um, all of this is really, always makes me really happy. No matter how tired I am, I walk out energized because we address all these issues from so many different angles. And that's what we have to do because we live in a time of complexity and there's no solutions in a reductionist way, no way. So it's great to have this and I hope we can take the rest of this time to just chat and hang out. And I'm sorry you guys out there can't do that with us. <laughs> Thank you. All right, drink and be merry. <laughs> that was so good. I so enjoyed those talks. Mm.